Well, I'm finally getting around to showing my drill press some love. We are going to convert it over to use a three-phase motor and a VFD. So this two-position start and stop switch has to go. We're going to replace it with a drum switch for direction, a knob to control the speed, and a display for the RPM. So stick around. <laughs> Welcome back to Cloud42, I'm James. This is my drill press. This is a Jet JDP-17MF, and it's, oh, I don't know, it's probably approaching 20 years old now. But uh, it's been a good drill press, but it is technically a woodworking drill press, so the speeds are more suited to mutilating dead tree carcasses than it is for working in metal. Uh, that said, it is a good solid drill press, and since I'm doing the spindle upgrade on my CNC mill, and I'm gonna be deleting the quill in that process. I would like to get this drill press working so I can use it for general drilling and tapping operations that I had been using the quill on the mill for. So we're gonna put a three-phase motor and a VFD into this, maybe mess around with the belt drives and replace it with something that can give me some lower gears in addition to the slow speed of the new three-phase motor. Uh, I have already replaced the inexpensive Jacobs chuck that came on it for a nice keyless chuck. That was just a matter of getting the right arbor and just popping it in. It's an MT2 uh, spindle taper. So that's already done. And the drill press, like I said, is in pretty good shape. I found a motor that will just drop in. Uh, we'll use the same VFD that I used on my lathe. So we'll be upgrading from three quarter horse to one horsepower. But the thing that needs some attention are these controls. So this is what the drill press came with. It's just a simple on and off switch. It only turns in one direction, so it's not reversible. And uh, of course I have no, uh, no way to control the speed. And I have already unplugged it because we are gonna be taking this apart. And what I would like to do is to use the stock factory control position to put in the controls for the VFD. So this switch plate uh, just attaches with a couple of screws here. We'll take it apart in a minute. And my first idea was to just make a plate that can replace this and use this existing housing. And so this is what I came up with. This is a 3D printed plate with uh, 3D printed with a dual extruder. I did another video on how to make control panels with a dual extruder. So this is actually white plastic embedded in the surface of a black 3D printed part. So I have my labels for reverse, forward, and then my speed minimum to maximum. And this plate is designed so that it holds those new controls and it will fit directly into this housing and use the same screw. So I can take these screws, take the switch out, get all the wiring and just put this back in in its place. But, and that would work just fine, but I would also like an RPM display. So I picked up one of these. This is just an inexpensive uh, import tachometer and you know the wiring on the back's all in Chinese, but uh, there's plenty of resources on the web, and I could put this in here someplace. But if this goes into this space, there's no place to put the tachometer, and the tachometer is actually wider than the switch plate, so it's not really possible to put it in there. I've seen people that have gone all the way up on the belt housing up here out of the shot where you can't see it and actually put the, and actually recess this into the front of the belt housing, but I'd like to maintain this space in the belt housing for belts, so I don't really want to put it up there. I'd really like it integrated into the controls down here. So what I think I want to do is replace this plastic nose piece. This is just a plastic part that fits on the front of the drill press casting, and I'd like to replace that with something that has room to hold the tachometer display with the controls below it, but still fits aesthetically into this space. So let's take this apart and take a look at what we're dealing with. Okay, so this is just uh, push buttons that go over the front of a switch. And again, I have unplugged this, so none of this is live. And the switch has got the wiring, and this is just directly switching the AC wiring for the motor. And then this is uh, the power for the lamp. There's a light bulb underneath here. And some ground wiring. And that looks like that is all that's in here. And then this housing is held on with three screws. Uh, 
Yep, I'll find that screw later. So we just have a simple plastic housing here on the front and my goal, again, I'm, I'm looking at this and I can imagine something about this same shape. It should be relatively straightforward to fit the tachometer into the top there. Seems like that ought to fit all right. And then extend the housing down to hold these switches in the space right below that. So let's take this over to the surface plate and measure it up and uh, see if we can 3D print something that will fit in this same space on the drill press but hold the new controls. My apologies if you hear the neighbor kids outside screaming. I'm not honestly sure if they're having fun or being murdered. This is the part we need to measure over here on the surface plate. Now, some of the measurements on this part are fairly easy to take with calipers uh, and some of them are not. But let's talk first about what measurements do we actually need. We're not trying to duplicate this part. We're trying to make a part that will fit into the same location. And so on the drill press, this back surface is where it interfaces to the drill press. So we need to accurately measure this outline, the shape of the outline, because this follows the casting around. We need the draft of the part. I don't know if you can see that very well, but this is not flat. It's actually, uh, there's draft into the center because the drill press casting that it fits against was molded with uh, sand molds from both sides. And then we need the locations of the mounting holes and the sizes of those mounting holes so that we can put similar geometry on the new part so it can be screwed to the front of the drill press. Now, some of these measurements can be taken with calipers, like the width here is relatively straightforward to take with calipers, 88.4 millimeters. And then below that, we've got some nice parallel sides, 75.8. Um, that's pretty straightforward. Trying to get this overall length is a little harder, again, because of the draft, I have to hold this square and I have no reference to get it square. And so it's much easier to take a measurement like that with the height gauge. So if I stand the part up, I can bring the height gauge in and measure the length of the part, sort of, except there's draft on this surface. So when I have it sitting here, it's not actually sitting straight. So I need something to square it up with. Now I could use a one, two, three block and try to hold that and try to get it square. Of course, the one, two, three block's lifting off, um, but the one, two, three block really isn't quite big enough. What's twice as good as a one, two, three block, or eight times as good, depending how you measure it, is a two, four, six block. And this is just an inexpensive import two, four, six block. They come in pairs. There's a link down in the description if you're interested where I got this one. And this is much easier. I can just put the part up against it, click it into place, it'll stand up straight, and then I can come out and take measurements off of the top of this part. And this will give me the overall length to the point. And then I can easily come out where it tapers down. I can get to the corner and I can get a pretty good estimate of the height on that corner, even though I'm gauging on a slightly angled surface and there's a little bit of a radius there. Now, the next thing that I need, I do need to know this height as well. I can get the length of that top, the wider part, just by coming down again with the height gauge and dropping it right down onto that, onto that surface. I can get a good measurement there. And then to locate the screw holes, I need some kind of datum and I'll just use this same datum on the bottom and I'll measure the height of the screw hole from that surface. And then I'll have to pick some other surface like the side here to measure how far in that screw hole is from the side. So to measure the height of the screw hole, we just find a gauge pin that just fits in the hole. Set that up against the 246 block, bring this down and just gauge the height of the top of the pin. And I'm getting 143.46 millimeters. And keep in mind, I then have to subtract half of the diameter of the pin, and that will give me the exact position of the center of that screw hole from this datum surface here on the bottom. And then to measure these holes on the side, I get a pin that fits in there. Press that down so it's uh, parallel to the, to the surface plate and touching. Push it up against the one, two, three block so it's level. And then I can do the same thing. I can come down and gauge on a pin in that hole and in that hole, subtract half the pin diameter and that gives me the position of those pins. 
Also got this opening on the top. It's not super critical, but I can easily estimate, you know, the width of the top of that with uh, calipers and the width of the base with calipers. And I can measure this, or if I really care, again, I can just put that surface right down on the surface plate and take that measurement with the height gauge. It's in about, and it's about 20 millimeters off of that front surface. So that is enough to give us all the geometry we need from the back. And I've already taken all of these measurements and uh, made a little chicken scratch diagram. I don't know if you can read this. I can barely read it, but I've got sort of just sketched the outline of the part and then scratched in all the dimensions that I could measure. The height to this point, the height to this point, the height from the base to the top of this pin and the diameter of the pin so I can subtract half the diameter. And I've just sort of sketched up what the bottom of this looks like. Here's an end view with the opening uh, sketched out for this opening on the end here. And then I've done a rough measurement of the opening here on the front. Since I made my switch panel to fit into this same opening that is already on this part, I might as well just take the dimensions from this for my new part. The exact position and where it is doesn't matter because we're gonna decide where we want it on the new part, but the opening can easily be measured with calipers. And for the position of the pins, of the screw holes, again, I just find pins that fit and I can very easily drop this in, measure the height of the base of the opening, measure the height of the top of the pin, measure the height of the top of the pin, and that gives me those dimensions. And um, one thing to note on this, the distance between that screw hole and the top of the opening and between this screw hole and the bottom of the opening are different, it's not symmetric. So I have the dimensions that I think I need, and I'll just leave this stuff set up here so as I'm designing the part, if I discover something that I didn't get, I'll come running back out and I'll take that measurement. Oh, and in fact, I did forget one. The draft here on the bottom, how do I measure that? Well, I know it's symmetrical, so I just need to know the height in the center. And I can do that also with a gauge pin just by laying this down and then coming in with the pin and feeling. And I've already done this, and this pin, which is 76 thousandths, sorry, my pins aren't metric, will just fit through right in the very center. You can hear it rubbing, but it won't, uh, it, but it only fits right in the center. And if I get a pin that's one thou larger, it won't slide in at all. So that gives me the draft. And from that, I can then calculate the correct angle or I can just draw this up in Fusion 360 with that measurement on the center and a couple of lines. And that'll give me a draft that I can then carry through the entire part so I can angle the screw tabs and everything else that needs to fit against the casting. So I think that's all the measurements I need. And like I said, I'll just leave this stuff all set up here so I can come back out and take more measurements if I need to. Let's go in the computer and design a replacement for this that will hold the controls we need. Okay, our strategy to model this part in Fusion 360 is gonna to be to draw a sketch for the base and a sketch for the top and then create a loft between them. So let's start with a sketch for the base of the part and I'll put it here on the XZ plane. And I think I'm gonna start with a mirror line, construction line up the center that we're gonna use just for mirroring. And then I will rough in Oops. And then I will rough in the shape of the part. Then we'll mirror this around the center line. The mirror command. And then start adding some dimensions to it. Start with the top dimension to make sure we don't turn anything inside out and that is 203, and we already did turn it inside out, whoops. And the top part is 57.27 millimeters, and the point down here at the bottom is one millimeter. Okay. Now we just need to put in the widths and the width of this bottom part is 75.4, and the width of the top is 88.5. Okay, okay, this sketch represents the base of the part where it actually contacts the front of the drill press. 
Now the other thing that we need to put in here are screw holes. So I will go ahead and make some circles for those. And I'm just attaching these to each other. And then I'll come back and use the equals operator to tie some of these together so they'll be the same size. And then add some dimensions. Now this bottom hole on the original part was a little bit bigger. It's actually seven millimeters. And let's make the boss around that 15 millimeters. And these top holes were about 6.8. So make that 6.8, make the boss around that. Mm, let's make that bigger. 13.2, I think is what it was on the original. There we go. And somehow I didn't get the equals constraint. There we go. And let's put these into position. Now these were all measured off of this bottom surface here. And this one is 139 millimeters. This is 52. And this one was 18. Okay, and then distance off of the side for these two, which are not centered, is uh, 16 and a quarter. Okay, and then we need to put in the lines for these to actually create the bosses or to create the, uh, the plastic tabs. So I will draw those two lines and then I will make them tangent, put them in the correct position. Okay, and then I will do the same thing up here. And the easiest way to do this to get the tangency is to draw the line and then have it actually snap to the circle. And you know what, I'm intentionally making sure these are not horizontal so that we don't end up with something weird. And then I can come back with the horizontal vertical constraint and snap those into position. Now I am gonna add a couple more lines in here because there's an issue that we're gonna run into because of the draft on the part. And we're gonna to need to have uh, an area to extrude that doesn't, doesn't go all the way to the edge. And we're gonna want this to go to within about one millimeter of the edge. And we'll get to that in a minute. The issue is that if we have this part lofted and then we extrude this area up because the outside wall is leaning in, if we extrude a, a, uh, a profile that goes all the way to the edge, it'll actually penetrate out through the side of the part. Okay, so that is our bottom sketch. Now let's draw our top sketch. And to do that, we need to draw a construction plane up off of this surface. And the height of the part is 80.2 millimeters. So that's where our next sketch needs to go. And uh, just so we don't have a whole bunch of lines in the way here, I am going to project construction lines for this, uh, for the the border around this. So I just hit P for project and I'm selecting all these lines and it will project those up into the new sketch. So we'll have them as a reference. Okay, now that we have those, I'm going to turn off the bottom sketch just so that it's not in the way and not causing confusion. Now that's the outline of the base just projected up onto this, we need to draw the outline for the top. And the way I wanna do that is by drawing the openings that we need first, and then come back and put a border around them. So I will use center rectangles, and I'm gonna do a couple of things here. I'm going to put a construction line down the center, and I'm gonna put a construction line across the center of the uh, top wider region here. So now when I come back and put in a center rectangle, I can center it in this opening. And then the other one's gonna be down here somewhere for the switch. Now the dimensions of this top opening are, uh, let's see, 76 by 40. And this is where the tachometer is gonna fit. So 76 by 40. And then the opening down here on the bottom to hold the switch panel is 111.2 by 66.4. And now we just need to get these positioned. Now I have the top one where I want it. Let's position this bottom one 10 millimeters below that. 
And so that gives us our opening for our switches and the opening for the tachometer. And then now we just need to put a border around this. Now, remember this dotted line is the base. We need to stay, you know, kind of over the top of that so the thing looks natural, but uh, the outline is gonna be different. So I will just go ahead and draw in, trying to avoid hitting any of these things and creating constraints. I'm just gonna draw a shape around this that I can then mirror around the center. Mirror around the center. And then we'll just control the width of the bezel here. So I'm just gonna dimension this six millimeters off of, the, off of all of these openings. And that'll give us a shape for the top that looks natural around the openings that we cut in it. Okay, and you can see it doesn't line up with the base. In fact, uh, in the switch portion, it's a little bit wider than the base that's against the casting. And up here at the top, it's actually slightly narrower than the base against the casting, and it's overall shorter. Okay, so now we have our two sketches. Turn those back on, and now we just need to create a loft between them. So I'll say create loft, and I'll come in here and select the bottom profiles that should be a part of the loft. And we only have to actually select the outermost ones just so that the outer border is correct. And then we need to select the region for the, the profile for the top and click OK. And now we have our loft. This is the shape. Now this is solid. We're not going to put it solid. We want it to be hollow and we're going to hollow it out from the back so that the back is open. But before we do that, I have this, the front here needs to be depressed in and I want to go ahead and do that first. So if I turn on this sketch and extrude this in 13 millimeters, then that gives us the recess for the switch panel. And now we can go ahead and create the shell. So shell command, click on the surface that we want to remove. The width that we want, thickness we want for the wall, I'm going to say four millimeters and it creates the loft for, or creates the shell for us. Now we just need to cut the openings that we want in the front. So I'll select this, extrude through all, and then we're also gonna want uh, an opening in here, but I want a lip, so let's create a new sketch here. Let's offset this three millimeters, and then use that to extrude. through all. Okay, so that gives us our basic shape, gives us a lip to set that switch panel against, gives us the opening that the tachodo tachometer will uh, snap into, and now we need to put in the screw mounts. So we'll turn this bottom sketch back on and select the profiles here and extrude those to 10 millimeters and we want to join those. Now you can see that what's happening here with this extrusion, as this goes down, this outside wall is actually tapering in. So if we actually extrude it all the way out to here, then you can see we would get a little ridge and a shelf in the side of the part. And we don't want that. And that's just because the wall is uh, sloping in. So if we take out that region, we avoid that. Okay, that gives us our tabs for the mounting screws to mount this onto the front of the drill press. Now there's a few more details. We can't actually mount this onto the front of the drill press because it has no draft. There's draft in the casting, but there's no draft in the base here, so we need to cut that out. And so we'll do the same thing we did before. We'll create an offset plane to give us, excuse me, we'll create a plane at an angle parallel with that edge and zero degrees makes that vertical. And you note there's some draft on the part. And since we want to cut the length of it parallel to the uh, length of the base of the part, we need this to be at zero degrees. So I'll create that surface. That's why we couldn't just sketch on this surface because it would then extrude off at an angle. And then we can create a sketch here. And let's project some of these lines so we have something to reference. And now let's put in some lines for the draft we want to create. 
and dimension that. And the total draft in the middle is a little bit less than a millimeter as measured off of the original part. Okay, so now we can select this region and extrude that and cut through all. Now we need to cut the opening in the top here. So let's bring up our plane here, create a sketch on that. We'll project some geometry and start drawing in some lines. We need a baseline across the bottom and then a construction line up the center to use for the mirror. And then we can draw in the lines for our opening. Mirror those around the center as usual. And put on some dimensions. And extrude this through to cut. And there we have our top opening. We still need some screw holes to mount the front switch plate on. So I'm gonna come in here and create a sketch on this surface. And I will just go ahead and draw up the tabs and the screw holes as they were in the original part with the same geometry. And then we'll just extrude to put in those tabs. And we'll use the two object, pick a point on this bottom surface, and that'll give us tabs that are connected. Okay, I think that is most of it. Let me uh, throw some fillets on here, hit F for fillet. Okay, and that softens that up. And then the last thing I wanna do is I think I wanna put a chamfer around the top. Maybe one millimeter, that'll just soften that edge, but it'll also still give us a clean edge that we can use to remove a brim. Cause I think we're gonna to wanna to print this with this front side down, just because it's flat and will give us the best chance of getting a successful print. Then the last thing I want to do on this part is stiffen some things up. This bottom tab is relatively long and that's going to be kind of flexible, especially if I print this in PET G. So I want some support behind it. And uh, same thing up here. I'd like to stiffen the center of this up. So I'm going to add a couple of ribs. So to do that, let's pick the YZ plane and create a sketch on that. And then I want to project a few lines here just to project these into the sketch so that I can um, have some reference geometry to work with. And then I'm going to come in and put some lines where I want the ribs. So I'll take a line from here to say there. And then up here, just put a line across here. Okay. Now I'll go in and say, create rib, select that line, three millimeter width is fine. You can see it's create a rib from that line down to the surface below it. And we'll do exactly the same thing down here. Turn our sketch back on, select that line, create rib. And of course you can change the width to whatever you want. I want three millimeters, that looks pretty okay and that's gonna create a rib in the part that's gonna stiffen up that bottom edge. Okay, I think that is our part. And uh, I like the shape of it. It's uh, fairly elegant. It's a little bit boxier just because we've had to slide the switches down instead of having them all the way up at the top. So it creates a little bit more bulk, but that's what you'd expect because we're creating the opening up here to put in the tachometer. Now let's talk about 3D printing. Go to File, 3D Print, and send this over to Simplify 3D. Okay, the first thing we need to do, we've got the 12 inch printer profile already loaded. I'm just gonna hit Control L and select this front surface and we'll place it down on the bed, say center and arrange. And so that'll place this on the flattest surface we have for printing. I think that's our best shot. 
Now, if you watch my last video on printing with ABS, you know that this is kind of the worst case scenario. I mean, overall, this thing is how long? One, two, three, four. This is what, eight inches long, which is 200 millimeters. Um, this is kind of the worst case scenario for printing in something like ABS because you've got these long solid sides with strands going the full length. So as this prints upward, any shrinkage at all is going to tear it off the bed down here and down here. And that is going to make this prove very difficult to print. Even in another material like PLA, even in a material like PETG that has very little shrinkage, there's still going to be enough shrinkage on a part like this to cause problems. So we're going to do, we're going to add a brim. Um, I actually printed this several times. I'll show you some of the failed prints, but um, the brim ultimately is what it took to get this down on the bed and printing it in pet G. So if we go over here to additions, use skirt slash brim. Okay. Prepare to print. And you can see it's added a brim around the bottom edge of the part. And this is five layers and or five uh, parallel extrusions. And that was enough to get it to stick long enough to print. Now there are other things. I thought about putting vents in the side. You'll also remember from the last video, one of the ways you can prevent that curling is by breaking up the long strands. So I saw it, thought about putting some vents in here, but there's nothing in here that generates heat. So there's no need for ventilation and doing that on a machine like a drill press that's going to create a lot of chips. I thought it was uh, very likely to lead to all kinds of junk getting inside. So I opted to take the printing challenge, use a material like PET G and do what I could to print it. And if I could succeed with the closed shape, we'd be better off in the long run. Now there's one other problem with this part. And that is that we get up to this point and then start printing these tabs out into space. So we need support material underneath those. Now, if I could print this in PLA, or if I could print this in ABS, the support material snaps off very easily. Since we're doing this in PET G, uh, the support material is harder to remove, but it's really necessary. I uh, don't really see any other way to print this that doesn't get us into trouble with the support material anyway. And the same is also going to be true when we get up to the top and start printing this bridge across and these tabs, those are going to have to have support material underneath them as well. So we'll go back here to the process settings, go to support, and we'll just say, go ahead and generate it. And I'm going to dial this down because we have that three millimeter wide ledge. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and dial the resolution down to one millimeter. And uh, these settings look fine and click prepare to print. And you can see it's generated support material towers right here. Now change the color so you can see it. It's generated support material towers up underneath these parts, underneath that bridge, and most importantly, uh, underneath these tabs to support those. So as this is printed, It'll be printing support material, not very dense, uh, up underneath that, cap it off, and then print the part on top. And this is very difficult to remove because it's PETG, but you know, with a little bit of uh, time and, and work with sharp tools, you can, you can pick it out. Okay, let's send it to the printer. And this is the finished product. We've got our opening for the switches. We've got our opening for the tachometer. And we've got our mounting hardware on the back. We've got our draft. And I've taken this over and test fit it on the drill press and it looks pretty good. Now, this was not my first print attempt. It turns out this part is very difficult to print. This was the first attempt and I don't know if you can tell, the camera's probably exaggerating the curve on the top here, but you can see it if I lay it down. This is not even remotely flat. Now, would this work? Yeah, absolutely this would work. You can drop this part in there and it'll screw down and you can put this on the drill press and you'd be good to go if you weren't me. And every time I saw that that was curved, every time I saw that this didn't line up perfectly, it would bother me. Plus in this scenario, I did actually get some stress cracks in the part 
from the shrinkage. So I tried again and I did some other tricks like putting a brim on the bottom as I laid that down to try to get it um, to print the, the first, very first print that I attempted, uh, which is not what you saw when I was running this through Simplify 3D. Uh, it, it, it just didn't stick, it curled like this. So I tried again. And this was attempt number two, and this one did have a brim around it, but the same thing happened. It curled, it's not as bad, but I also stopped it part way through and gave up on that completely and just ditched it. Decided that I'd be better off printing in PET-G. So you can see this part's got more sheen to it, and that's because uh, the PET-G produces a much shinier surface. But it is, there was a tiny, tiny bit of curl on the end, but unless you put it down on a surface, you're not really gonna see that or feel it. Uh, I did add a couple more features, like I added some little pinholes here so that you could press in and press the tabs out to get the tachometer back out. But uh, let's go ahead and fit things in. Uh, this is the switch plate, and uh, this is actually two parts. There is uh, an actual panel with uh, an opening to recess the front plate of the switch into. The first prototype, I had that sitting proud on the surface. I didn't really like how that looked, so I made another prototype that sunk it in, and I also switched from ABS to PET-G so that the sheen on the plastic would be the same. And then uh, this switch had a front panel that said on, off, on, and I printed a replacement with the uh, letters embedded and that just snaps into the front of the panel so I get this nice, clean look. And that just sits right into the front. Doing a couple prototypes also gave me a chance to tune the size of the screw holes so these screws would thread in easily. Those are the switches. And then we have the tachometer and it just snaps in. And that is the finished product. Reverse, forward, we have the speed control. And when it's powered up, we'll read out the display, uh, read out the RPM display in nice big red letters behind that lens. So compared to the original part, you can see the front is slightly wider and that's just because we needed the space for the, uh, for the display, but the footprint on the back is identical. So this will fit into exactly the same space on the drill press. So we need to do a little bit of wiring and this should be ready to go on and we will continue with that project in a future video. If you are enjoying these videos, please give me a thumbs up, feel free to subscribe to the channel and leave me a comment. I'd like to know what you think. Thank you for watching.